your financial advisors. A registered investment advisor, this show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full informed investment decision. This is your money, your wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMV. Now, here's Joe Anderson and Big Al Clopine. Hey, welcome back to the show. The show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joe Anderson here, Big Al Clothline. Big Al is a CPA. I'm a certified financial planner. Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to go to this email, Big Al. All right, you got some good questions? I do. And each week we've been doing this with rave reviews because a lot of you have the same questions. Yeah. Right? And so uh, we teach a lot of adult education, and it seems like as soon as one person asks the question, it's like, oh, yeah. I, I, I thought yeah, that, yeah. yeah. I kind of thought of that, right. too. So if you do ever have a question, you can go to info at purefinancial.com. Info at purefinancial.com. So here's a quick question for you, Big Al. Okay. Um, will I be penalized for an excess contribution to my IRA is the title of the email. Okay. And uh, the body of the email is, I'm 66 years old. Okay. I contributed 6500 to my IRA in January 5th of 2016. Okay. I recently retired and rolled over my IRA okay, to purchase service credits. The entire IRA balance was transferred to my Washington State retirement account. Okay. Do I have to pay the excess penalty or since the account is technically zero and closed, is this considered a distribution? Am I going to be penalized? Okay. Well, it I don't have quite enough information. So, but I guess what we know is he's 66. He put in $6,500 into his IRA on January 15th of this year. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. What we don't know is did he have earned income this year? He doesn't really say. He says he retired this year, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's a good point because I think that's the only way that he could have an excess contribution if he didn't have earned income. Right. But I think what he's thinking is that he made a contribution and he did a rollover. Yes. So he's assuming that the rollover from his plan going into the IRA would be an excess contribution is what how I read that. Yeah, that's how you, how you read it, and that's, that's not a problem. So as long as you had $6,500 of earned income, you're allowed to do an IRA. There's no excess contribution. Now, on the other hand, if he didn't work at all, in 2016 and he tried to put $6,500 well that's you can't do that that's a prohibited transaction and they'll charge you 6% interest for as long as that's in the account it could be 10 years right, right. and uh, interest upon interest so you don't want to do that but as, as long as you got enough earned income to cover it or your spouse does could be spouse as well then yeah you can put money into an IRA you may or may not be able to deduct it based upon your income level and if you're in another retirement plan but you can certainly put the dollars in so let me answer this succinctly for this person. Okay. Is that um, to contribute to $6,500, you need earned income, right? Um, or if you don't have earned income, that would be called an excess contribution. A rollover into an, an, an IRA, that would not apply to an, you know, an, an over contribution to a retirement account. Because if I contributed 6,500 and all of a sudden 200,000 came into that IRA, it's like, oh, well, I can only put in $6,500 into an IRA. Well, a rollover d doesn't compute in that overall calculation. Yeah, that's right. That's, it's, it's only the 6,500 that you actually put in versus do you have enough earned income to cover that? Right. And then to, to carry on is that this individual then, he, he, he or she, took the retirement and, and bought service credits for their pension plan is right. what they're doing. Right. So it's like, okay, well here, I want more service credit. So I roll over my retirement plan and then I put it into an IRA and then in the IRA, he put it into the Washington state retirement account. Right. So to buy more service credits to increase his pension. Sure. So I guess the question there too is, was, was that the right move? Well, and that we don't know. We don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot more questions we'd have to ask. Right, but I think we get that question often. It's like, okay, well, here, I have a retirement account. I'm working for the state. I have an, uh, or, or maybe I'm a, a school teacher or whatever. I have this retirement account. Should I purchase more service credits? Right. And what is the taxability of that? Sure. Right? And you can roll money from an IRA into your pension plan to buy more service credits to increase your pension. It's That's a non-taxable event. It's just like a rollover. It just goes into that state retirement to increase your pension. Um, you could do it with after-tax dollars. After-tax dollars, in some cases, is a better bet 
Because what happens then is then the income that you receive could be pro rata. Yep. So you're not going to get double taxed on that. Part of it. Part, part of it's it. tax free. Yeah, yeah, part of it would be so, tax so free or return of basis. And I you. think a lot of people that are retired, they, they get this, they get, let's just make this up, 10000 bucks a year. But then they get their 1099 that says, yeah, you got 10000 bucks a year, but 9400 is taxable. Right, because in this case, six hundred dollars wasn't taxable because some of the money in this plan was after-tax dollars. That's what we're talking about, and that percentage it's computed in that first-year retirement, and then you get that same percentage all the way through all the way throughout your retirement. Right. Yeah. So, but you you have to do some calculations too to say, all right, well, what am I looking at? What am, what what's the overall goal? Do I want to? And, and then we get the question: Should I take a lump sum? So this is sure. for the state, and states won't give you a lump sum. But let's say if I work for a private company, right? then they'll say, Alan, hey, thank you for your service. Um, I'll give you a lump sum, or I will give you an annuity payment or a pension payment. Sure. What do you have to look at here today is that how they calculate you know, the annuity stream in some organizations, and we're familiar with, let's say, Raytheon. We have many, many clients that work at Raytheon. Sure. And so it's hypothetically. So it's <laughs> so then they look at the PBGC rate, okay? And then that's going to determine how much lump sum that individual re will receive. So if interest rates are low, as they are today, right? So, so if interest rates go up, let's say, next year, what's going to happen to their lump sum option? If interest rates go up next Correct. year, it's so, going to reduce it. Right, it's going to reduce it. And the reason for that is that how pensions look at this is they say, all right, well, here's the interest rate right, that I can receive on my money. And if that interest rate goes up, that means I can generate more income. Right? There's more, pro or there's more um, coupon payments or there's more income that can come out of the overall pension. If that rate's very low, you need a huge lump sum to create a retirement to income. To cover that. If interest rates go up, you don't need as much lump sum for the same income. Yeah, because you're getting a, 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 hypothetically a higher rate of return. So if you can lock in when interest rates are low, that could be a pretty good deal. Right. And yeah. so then in that case, you, you might want to take a look lump, at the lump, lump sum. sum. Right. But if, it, if interest rates are high, you might do the opposite. You, you got it, right. Yeah. And I think for years, I mean, I've been doing this close to 20 years. Al's been doing this close to 30. And so I would say prior to maybe six, seven years ago, I, I thought the, the annuity, the income was always a, a lot better way to go because interest rates were at 5%. Sure. But now they're at, I mean, you know, in some countries, a negative interest rate environment. Yeah, right. And then you have to look at the funding of these pension plans. So there's a lot of different things that you want to make sure that you take a look at. So before you go in and, and purchase service credits, which m might make a ton of sense. I'm not saying not to do that, but you right. just got to do the math. And in some cases, Joe, these plans have cost of living increases. And in some cases, they don't. And that's a pretty big factor. Let's say you retire at 62 and you're in good health. And uh, maybe you're going to live into your 90s. Having that inflation or that cost of living increase would be a big deal for you. Huge. So there's multiple factors that you want to make sure that you look at when it comes to making some of these decisions. Now back to your money, your wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Hey, welcome back to the program. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joe Anderson here. I'm a certified financial planner with Big Al Clopine. Hey, Al, I got a question for you here. Okay. Will the 401k distribution tax be offset by the loss of my Section 1231 property. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. I like that. I was the sole owner of a Section 1231 property, and it sold for a loss of 25000 I want to take the 25000 distribution from my 401k. I am 62 years old. If done in the same tax year, can the net operating loss of Section 1231 real estate be used to reduce taxes on my 401k distribution? Excellent. So I better explain what all that means. Please. <laughs> so when you buy a rental property, that would be investment a, property. Investment. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to. That's the most commonly a, like a rental property, like a single family home, condo. You rent it out to a tenant. That would. This would be a common type of, of, of situation. So you bought the property. Maybe you bought it in whatever 2005, 2006, when the market was high, and and you're selling it. And you sold it at a time when the when the the price actually went down. So in other words, you have a loss on that property. So typically, we know that the general rule is this. When you have a capital asset, which could be stock, bond, mutual fund, even real estate, when you have a capital asset it's uh, and you hold it for at least a year at a gain, you pay a special capital gains rate, which is cheaper. Capital gains rate is 0, 15, and 20%. 
plus a Medicare surtax. Regular tax rates start at 10 and they go to 39.6. So that's capital gains. But when you have a loss, a capital loss, you can only offset it against capital gains. Or if you don't have any capital gains or you have more losses than gains, you get to take another $3,000 in this case against a 401k. That's the capital loss rules. Now when you have a rental, I would say most CPAs that I know of, including myself, interpret a rental as a business. And when you have a business, so if a rental property is a business because you've got a tenant, you're in business to make money through renting out a property, then that qualifies for a special tax treatment because it's a business asset. It's under Code Section 1231, which simply means this. If it goes, if, if you sell the property, the rental property, at a gain, you get that lower capital gains rate. But if you sell it at a loss, you get an ordinary loss deduction, which means you can offset that $25,000 against any income. It doesn't have to be a capital gain. It can be any income. So the answer to this question is yes. You can offset the loss of this Section 1231 property, though I'm just going to call it a rental because people understand that better than 1231. You can offset the, the loss on sale of the rental with the 401k income, dollar for dollar. So right. yes. and, and we've done this quite a bit in our practice, is that, all right, well, here, I have a loss, um, this property that I bought in Florida, Las Vegas. Yes. Right? Yeah, two common areas of losses. And it's like, okay, what do I do? Or maybe it was um, an apartment building that he was a tenant in common in, or what? It didn't matter. It's like, okay, well, you have a 1231 loss, and they're holding on to it for dear life, but they know that, all right, the rents that they're receiving, there's vacancies, it's not in a great area. Yeah, it, it, they're just you know, going backwards. They're fast. just going backwards, right, yeah. because they're negative cash flow. Right. And it's like you're negative here. It's, it's going to take you about 150 years to break even. Yeah. So let's just, right? <laughs> yeah, let's rip off the band-aid. Let's get, rip off get, the band-aid. Get, get and then, oh, by the way, you know, I understand it hurts to lose the 25000 in this example, but Al and I have seen 50000 a 100000 a couple hundred thousand dollar losses on these properties. But it's like, all right, well, how about this? Now we can take $200,000 from your retirement account and we can convert that into a Roth IRA. Yes. And pay zero tax on the conversion. And that's hard to believe because people think, well, I, I don't want to do a Roth conversion because it's really expensive. I got to pay taxes on that conversion. Well, not if you take that $200,000 conversion and offset it with a $200,000 Section 1231 loss, or in this case, the 401k. Instead of taking $25,000 out of your 401k and putting it in your checking account, why don't you convert that to a Roth IRA? Because now all future growth is tax-free. It's same, same. You got $25,000 of income from the Roth conversion, but you got a $25,000 loss from, I'm going to say, from this rental property sale. You net those two together, and, and what when the dust settles, you got twenty five grand in a Roth IRA, and you paid zero tax to do it. And this is only on um, an investment or, or 1231 yes, property. We, we have to be careful. It's not a stock. It's and, not a bond. And, I mean, that's a capital loss. You cannot offset ordinary income with the capital loss. You can offset capital gain income with the capital yeah, loss. Yeah, and I will also say, uh, in all honesty, not all CPAs agree with me. I would say the majority do, but I have seen some that say, no, that's crazy. You can't say a rental property is a business. And so, they for, therefore, they don't call it Section 1231. So it depends upon the interpretation. And it's, it's yet another reason why taxes are so hard to interpret because they're, they're complicated and different people read it different ways. And I'll say something else, Joe, and we see this actually quite often. Let's say you bought a property for a couple hundred thousand dollars in 2005 and then in Las Vegas, just because that was a, an area, and I had property there, so I know this. <laughs> Properties went down about 70%. So all of a sudden, that property that you have is worth sixty thousand or seventy thousand dollars. Well, you don't really feel like feeling like selling it then because your loan is one hundred twenty or whatever it is. So you wrote it out, you wrote it out, you wrote it out, and finally you get to the point where it's one hundred ninety thousand. Let's just say, and you're but you're sick of it. You want to sell it. What you're, was the purchase price? Two hundred. All right. Two hundred. You bought it for two hundred. It's now worth one ninety. And so you're thinking, when I sell it, I've got a $10,000 loss. Good. At least I, I don't want to lose money, like you said, Joe, but at least I can take this loss against other income, as we just talked about. Well, what you might have forgot depreciation. is depreciation, because every single year you get to write off a piece of this property. And I bet you you probably depreciate it six, 7000 bucks a year. So let's say $6,000 a year. Ten years ago, 
just you know approximately sure. 50 grand so you have to take the $200,000 purchase price subtract the 50,000 depreciation so your tax basis is 150 so you sold it for 190 thinking you had a $10,000 loss but the IRS says no you got a $40,000 gain because you already wrote off all this depreciation so we want you to pay that back let me ask you this let's just say if i did have a true $25,000 ordinary loss from a sell of, uh, or maybe it's a net operate, but let's just call it this twelve thirty one loss to okay. keep things um, incongruent of our discussion. Yeah, okay. And I don't have any income that year, right? Maybe I'm living off of cash. I'm sure. retired. I okay. don't. I'm not collecting zero income. Okay. Okay. So, is that deduction? And I sell the property. I take the loss. Is that? Can I move that loss to another tax year, or is it lost forever? Uh, you can. So what happens? Is it the same rules as, as a net operating loss? Yeah, it's how net operating losses are created. So here, here's the way that that works. So let's say that's the only thing you have on your tax return is income. So your just to gross income is negative twenty five thousand dollars. Then you got to look at your itemized deductions, and I'm not going to get into this because some of those will add to this net operating loss, others won't. But let's just say you got another five thousand dollars of itemized deductions that add to the net operating loss. So now you got a thirty thousand dollar loss that cannot be. There's no value. So the IRS says that you have to carry that loss back two years. So right now we are in 2016. So when you do your 16 return, you go back to 2014. There's a special form that you fill out to do this. And it and it's basically shows it as if that $30,000 loss was in 2014. You recompute your taxes. And if you, obviously your taxes will be lower because you got less income and you get a refund. Okay. So now if you take it back two years and you only needed to use 10,000 bucks because your income was low then. So now you still have a $20,000 carry forward. You do that into 2015. Okay, so you do the same exercise. If you still have extra, now you take it forward to 2017 and you go 20 years, 2017 through 2036, if I did my math right. So that's how that works. And the only, th the only decisions that you make at the point of the, of the year of the loss is whether you want to do the standard method, which is go back two years and forward 20, or you can elect to forego the carryback period and say, I don't want to go backwards. I just want to use this going forward. And you would do that if you thought your income tax bracket was, was going to higher. be higher in the future than uh, in the, in, you know, back uh, maybe a couple of years ago. And Joe, it's, it's yet another example of taking control of your taxes. Once you get to know what some of the rules are, you can actually literally pay a lot less in taxes. And I'll tell you, when you're in retirement or close to retirement, it becomes more important than ever because now you're creating your own income stream from your own assets. So you got to really understand what those tax laws are so you can keep more of the money that's really rightfully yours. This is Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Hey, welcome back to the program. The show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Uh, Joe Anderson here. I'm a certified financial planner with uh, Big Al Clopine. He's a CPA. Uh, stick around next segment. Um, wrapping up the show uh, with Dr. Daniel Crosby, uh, behavioral finance uh, expert. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm really excited to speak with him. Uh, he's written a couple of great books, New York Times bestseller. Um, and his latest is The Laws of Wealth. And our worst enemy when it comes to investing, unfortunately, is sometimes ourselves. It does turn out to be ourselves. It's not the market. It's our reaction to the market and, and making the wrong decisions. Right. It's not the market. It's not the product. It's not the fees. It's us handling our emotions. <laughs> yes. So, um, but we're, we're here today making you smarter. Yeah, we are. And so I think uh, anyone that's listened to a full two hours today... It's like they are so smart. PhD. <laughs> they got a PhD uh, in I, finance. Here. I don't know if I'd go that far. Should I cash out my investments or continue to invest? Okay. Mm. I'm okay. 65 years old. Yep. And for 20 years have been very ill. Really? <laughs> for 20 years. Well, that's too bad. I've been on Social Security for a while now. My okay. wife is the same age and has a small home business. Okay. We have 50000 total in our name. Our house is paid off. As I'm slipping fast, my family wants me out of all investments in, into cash. I want to invest in some dividend stocks for income. What are my best options? Wow. that's Well, first of all, that's too bad. Yes. 65 and you've had 20 poor years in front of that and the future doesn't look that good. That's too bad. Hopefully 
very few people have that situation. But Joe, so we got uh, we got a couple. This isn't just an individual. This is two people. And it's a couple of different questions too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's start with um, fifty thousand dollars. And and you got now if if it were just a single person at sixty five and the and the prognosis wasn't all that good in terms of maybe living a year or two. Yeah, maybe you go to cash. But in this case, we got a married couple. Uh, the wife is probably in decent health because she's still got a home business. And if she's six, about the same age, right? So if she's 65, she could live into her 90s. Now, $50,000 isn't really much to work with. But still, if you think about, I mean, a lot of people have a tendency to say, well, once I retire, let's not take any risk anymore because I, I shouldn't because I'm going to be drawing down. Well, if you are going to live for two, three, or four years, maybe that's a good strategy. But most of us, the average 65-year-old uh, lives into their 80s, mid to late 80s. Right. right, and that's going up, too. And that's going up. And so the, the fact of the matter is is you've got a much longer time horizon than you think. So you do need to stay invested, but you may not want to be as aggressive as you were while you were accumulating. And, of course, we don't know what they've got and, and all that sort of thing. But I tend to agree with the, uh, the person that wrote the question is, uh, yeah, because it sounds like he would rather stay invested at least on some level. So I do agree with that. As far as how much they should have in different kinds of stocks and bonds and safety, that's a that's a whole question we don't have near enough information for. Yeah, but, I mean, one of his statements is one scares me a little bit is that all right you only have fifty thousand dollars your wife is healthy you're not that healthy and then that's what you have to your name your home is paid off which is great yes uh but then it's like i want to invest in some dividend stocks okay well i mean i could get larry spudger on (laughs) and he'd have a you know know. four hour there's a lot of issues with with a concentrated asset class like that and and even that one because so many people want it right now but it's still you can make your own dividend which people still don't understand i agree with that it's a, a dividend is not a coupon payment it's not there's a difference between a loan and ownership of a stock right right and so for small business owners, I think they understand this a little bit more because if they're taking distributions from their company, right, that's called a dividend. Right. And so what happens to the assets of that company when they take that dividend? Yeah, so let's think about this. You're taking cash out of the company. So now all of a sudden the company is less valuable because you're, you're taking assets out of it. Correct. Right. And so what happens to the stock price as soon as they give you a dividend it goes down in the same amount of the dividend <laughs> exactly yeah so it's a dollar dividend ten dollar stock they give you a dollar dividend the next day right the stock price is now trading at nine dollars a share yes i think a lot of people don't realize that. no because they think it's a coupon let's say it's a bond so i have a bond right ten dollar bond yeah and that gives me a dollar coupon the bond tomorrow is worth what ten dollars right because it's an interest payment yes not a distribution so there's two different things, but you hear dividend. Hey, I love this stock because it's giving me a huge dividend. Well, they're just giving you distributions from the company. The, 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 the value of the company goes down the same exact day as they're giving you that distribution. So be careful of how you're trying to create income because a lot of advisors out there right, that I hear, right, there's different strategies for different people and dividend paying stocks is one that they tout. You know, maybe it's preferred stocks. Maybe it's master limited partnerships. Maybe it's um, real estate investment trusts, right? Annuities, BDCs. I mean, th- there's a lot of different products that might sound good on the surface, but there is no free lunch here. You have to understand how all this stuff works out. Hey, this company is great because it's giving me a 5% dividend. Well, that 5% dividend, it, 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 it's, it, correlates to the stock price you can take a five percent distribution from your portfolio too it is the exact same thing yeah so what we're talking about there is you could sell five percent of your portfolio and create your own dividend right correct and then now you got capital gain if you held this that stock or mutual fund whatever for at least a year it's long-term capital gain and here's the advantage joe is you get to pick when you want that so-called we call it a synthetic dividend in a way because you're creating your own dividend you get to pick when you want to take that that money and when it hits your tax return. A high dividend paying stock, you're at the mercy of what the board of directors decides. Exactly. And and it's like, okay, well, they can cut the dividend. So then what happens? 
right? Well, this company's never cut the dividend. All right, whatever. <laughs> okay, I mean, you have to. Maybe, I mean, more and more people need to get this education so sure. they can make better decisions because but, but, they might be taking yeah. on way too much too much risk than they realize in their overall portfolio. And a lot of individuals cannot take that type of risk because if something bad happens. Right? Are they prepared for it? No, because a lot of us haven't saved nearly enough. And all of a sudden, the market corrects, and you're betting on this one strategy that you think is a safe strategy, but you truly don't understand the underlying risks of the strategy. Sure. As long as you understand it, you're fine with it, then go for it. But I would guess 99% of people that are listening to our pro well, not our program, I guess in the general public, that they don't understand that a dividend is not an... It, it's not an interest payment. Right. Your stock price goes down. It's just a distribution of wealth of the overall company. You could do the exact same thing. Now back to your money, your wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Hey, welcome back to the show. The show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joe Anderson here, certified financial planner. Big Al Clopine, he's a CPA. Alan Clopine. Yes, sir. We got a great guest. Yeah, Daniel Crosby. He's going to tell us why we're making all kinds of mistakes with our investments. You know, I am a huge fan of behavioral finance. Behavioral. Be you know, get, you, pronounce it. Whatever. We worked on it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I practice this. I swear to God, I do that. And, you know, we've had Carl Richards on our show. Yes. The Behavior Gap. But this book by Dr. Daniel Crosby has taken it to a different level because he dives into all these different biases that we have. And this is probably one of the most important things that investors need to know. And he makes it fun. He makes it light. But there's a lot of really good information. The book is called The Laws of Wealth. And I'm telling you, you have to get this book. This is one of the best books I have read. And I read a ton of financial planning and finance books. So I'm extremely excited to have the good doctor on, Daniel Crosby. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, great to be here. Hey, I got a question for you. You've been studying behavioral finance, and it's funny. It's like our, our brains are not meant to deal with money, but it's a necessity that we need. And there's so many different I, – I, in your book, would you take like 127 different biases that we have, and then you try to make it as simple as possible to cram it down into uh, di just different segments here? Yeah, I looked. At, I think there were 117 different ways that you can screw it up and get it wrong, <laughs> and I tried to I tried to flip it on its head a little bit, and you know, just winnow it down to a couple of simple rules uh, because nobody can keep track of uh, 117 ways, right? Absolutely not. <laughs> Even I can't as an accountant. <laughs> but the industry works on, all right, well, here, you have to have the right asset allocation. You have to be worried so much about fees and the products. and everything. Yes, I think that is so important. But in your book, you look at is that, well, the behavior is probably the biggest problem. And you have to take conventional wisdom when it comes to our money and just basically, like you said, kind of turn it upside down or throw it out the window. Yeah, in the book, I talk about Wall Street bizarro world is the term I coined for this concept, but there's so many things in our regular lives uh, that are just flipped on their heads when it comes to investing. Like in investing, more activity tends to get you worse results, whereas if you're you know lifting weights or reading books or any other thing, doing more gets you more. The opposite's true in investing. Uh, the same is true of consuming financial media. I talk in the book about how people who watch more uh, CNBC tend to have worse results. You know, the people who are monitoring every little thing that Janet Yellen does are actually getting outperformed by people doing nothing at all. Um, so there's a lot of ways in which investing runs very contrary to our natural human tendencies, for sure. One of the things that I enjoyed is, you know, when you look at the things we use every day, right? If I want to go to a new restaurant, right, I'm going to use the power of crowds with Yelp. But the power of crowds or the herd mentality when it comes to investing is probably the opposite thing that you should do. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a couple of really specific reasons for this. I do talk in the book. You know, I travel a lot. I'm going to Dublin tomorrow. Very excited about that. Um, but, you know, when I'm in a new city, I absolutely turn to Urban Spoon or Yelp and, and crowdsource opinions on what's good and what's not. Always look at Rotten Tomatoes before I go to a movie. Uh, but, but in investing, again, that idea tends to be turned on its head. We find that the most crowded trades, the most comfortable trades, the most popular trades uh, tend to be some of the very worst. Um, so you really do have to cultivate this sense, this contrarian sense and this sort of sense of schadenfreude of having, uh, you know, finding pleasure in others' pain and becoming a, <laughs> a little bit crazy to be a good investor, frankly. 
what what prompted you to write the book? What what kind of um, got your juices going to spend some time in dissecting 117 different biases that we have? Well, the, you know, like you said from the outside of the show, um, you know, over the last 20 years, the market's given you about eight and a quarter percent returns, uh, but the average investor has only held on to about four percent of that. And when you strip out inflation, it's basically nothing. You know, you've kept about one percent real per year. So people are giving up more than half of what the market gives them to bad decision making. So part of it was just sort of the sense of urgency that I had that people weren't aware that they were making such bad decisions and they weren't aware of the, the incredible impact it was having on their wealth. Um, you know, Natixis did a great study recently that showed that 83% of financial advisors said uh, that, that managing emotion was the biggest, uh, the biggest thing that was going to predict whether or not their clients made it to the finish line, made it to sort of a comfortable retirement. But when they turned around and asked these investors, you know, is managing your emotion a big deal? Does it, is it material when it comes to your performance? Only 6% of them said yes. So part of the reason why I wrote the book is to try and address the delta between, um, you know, what the research says are the, the determinants of investment returns and what most people understand them to be, uh, because there's a wide chasm there. What do you think is the biggest bias that hurts us the most? I mean, there's so many of them, but what, I mean, could you pick one or what's your favorite? What's your favorite? <laughs> favorite <laughs> bias. <laughs> do, do, okay, do, so, do you have a favorite uh, disability uh, that, that we can chat about? <laughs> I'll give I'll give a favorite bias I'll give a favorite bias of the 117 and then I'll talk a bit about how I broke them down into just five right so the of the 117 my favorite is what's called Dunning Dunning Kruger syndrome which is named after the the folks who researched it and sort of found it out uh, but they found Dunning and Kruger found that um, smart people tend to be very insecure and self doubting. And stupid people tend to be so stupid that they lack an awareness of how stupid they are. So basically, uh, all of the best people in the world are walking around full of insecurity, and all the dummies are walking around uh, having a great life. And so when <laughs> when this comes to you know when this comes to investing, there's uh, there's often an inverse correlation to how between how certain you are about something and how certain you ought to be. So I always love uh, Dunning Kruger about people who are dumb to know how dumb they are. Um, but 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 in terms of one of the one of the parts of the book, I, I turn these 117 into a behavioral risk taxonomy, which is just a funny you know shrink way of saying I broke it out into what are the what are the five sort of uh, psychological pillars that underlie these 117. And so it was ego, which is uh, sort of overconfidence. There's emotion, which is uh, our, our feelings, our emotions tend to color our risk perception. Uh, there's conservation, which is we have a preference towards uh, the status quo and we're loss averse. Then there's information, which is that we construe information in sort of imperfect, flawed, incomplete ways. And then there's what I call attention, uh, which is the, the tendency for salience to trump probability, which basically means how how dramatic something is uh, uh, makes us weigh it as more probable. Like if I told you uh, that this year so far three times as many people have died taking selfies as have been bitten by sharks, uh, most people would find that hard to believe, uh, but that's the case. So um, – Selfies are sort of every day, and so we don't think of them as dangerous, even though probabilistically they're much more likely to kill you than a shark attack. Yeah, I, I saw one of your TED Talks where you, I think you were talking about it's more likely to be killed by your TV falling on you than, than by like 10 times than to win the lottery. Right, right, right. Yeah, and I said in that TED Talk you're more, I think you're, you're more likely to be killed by your appendix than ISIS or something to that effect, <laughs> which is uh, – Definitely true. And then statistically, the person most likely to kill you is your spouse. So that's uh, some some fun weekend yeah. trivia for you. <laughs> Maybe I should stay at work longer. <laughs> uh, but it's it's funny because we are overconfident, right? It's I, I think most people think they're better looking than they are. Most people think they're a better driver than they are. Uh, most people think that they're a better investor than they are, and it's it's hard for them to maybe take a step back and say, you know what, I shouldn't probably be doing this. I'm blowing up my portfolio. But with some of your examples of going through, like making it real life, um, I think it helps the overall individual say, you know what, this this could be me. Yeah, I, I hope so. You know, and it's it's interesting because you say most of us are overconfident, and that's definitely the case. So. 
most people are overconfident, and the people who aren't overconfident uh, tend to be depressed. <laughs> there's not <laughs> there's not a whole lot of there's not a whole lot of middle ground. So either you're sort of ex- excessively confident, and that's a problem when you're investing, or you're excessively bummed out, and that's going to lead you to be overly bearish and make poor uh, you know poor decisions as well sometimes. Um, even though research suggests that pessimists are uh, better investment decision makers than optimists. Um, but yeah, one of the things, one of the chapters in the book is titled quite bluntly, You Are Not Special. And it's just encouraging people to take a rules-based, research-based approach to investing instead of trying to rely on um, just being a, sort of a junior Warren Buffett or, or having some idea that they've got some special skill. Yeah, and we also hate losing. You know, and it's like sometimes you just got to cut loose, but they want to continue to hold on to that stock as long as they can because they think it's going to go back. Or, you know, I work for this company. I know the inside scoop, and uh, I'm going to continue to hold. You know, it's buying what they know. I mean, there's so many. We could probably spend four hours talking about this. But what I want everyone to do is that uh, Dr. Daniel Crosby wrote this book. It's called The Laws of Wealth. And I'm going to give... um, I will personally buy the first 10 callers that calls our show um, this book that's sitting in my hand. Uh, But besides that, uh, they could get it, what, on Amazon? Yeah, on Amazon is probably the easiest way. There you go. The Laws of Wealth by Dr. Daniel Crosby. Or call 888-994-6257, and I will personally buy them the book because I think more and more people need this. Hey, uh, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. I know you're a busy guy. Have fun in Dublin. Are you going to have a couple of cocktails, you think, while you're over there? Maybe a couple beers? Uh, we'll, we'll get us. I, don't, I, don't e- I don't even drink, which means the trip to Dublin totally wasted on me. So. <laughs> Well, enjoy, enjoy the clouds. <laughs> yeah, enjoy the greenery <laughs> and the accents. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, guys. <laughs> hey, um, hopefully we can get you on the show again. Um, it was a true pl- uh, pleasure talking to you. Um, that's it for us today, folks. Uh, for Big Al Clopine, I'm Joe Anderson, and I want to thank again Dr. Daniel Crosby. The show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. We'll see you next week.